Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome back Simon Box. Simon um, is uh, Simon did his PhD in Cambridge, and we actually met. Um, we met one day when I went into college to have lunch, and this young man sat next to me and plonked a document down on the table, and it turned out to be his draft PhD thesis. And you'd just had your viva, I think, but minutes earlier. Uh, and the title looked rather interesting, so we got chatting, and anyway, by the end of lunch, he had an internship offer, and because uh, I realised this was a very, very bright young man, and um, he came to an internship with us on simulating rocket trajectory flights. I'm interested in rocketry, and managed to combine that with a bit of Gaussian process modelling of the distribution of wind directions in the atmosphere, so we did sort of Monte Carlo simulations of rocket trajectories, uh, and after his internship... Simon went to Southampton, and uh, he's going to tell us a bit about his research at Southampton. Thanks very much, Chris. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Chris. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about some research we've been doing in the South at the University of Southampton into dynamic control, real-time control of systems that have <coughs> lots of humans in the loop. Um, so to kind of motivate this, I want what I'm thinking about here, I, I want to kind of uh, give you... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh. Sorry, sorry, sorry. oh dear. Sorry, I probably turned it off in my pocket back. How, how's that? Oh, yes, I can hear myself now. <laughs> so, so to motivate this, I just want to kind of... Um, uh, I want to kind of guide you through an imaginary scenario, right? So I want you to imagine that you're... You're going to the airport, so you jump in a taxi, and the taxi whisks you down very busy streets, but you don't experience any congestion, and you don't find yourself waiting at any red lights. Right? You, you arrive at the airport, and you walk up to the check-in desk, and you hand over your passport and your bag without having to queue or wait. You then go off and browse some shops, maybe buy some things from your family and, for your family, and then when it's time, you walk through security without any delay and straight onto the plane and into your seat. So I'm pretty sure none of you have ever had an experience like that. <laughs> Um, it sounds a, a bit like a fantasy. Um, of course, if you took the humans out of these systems, all these systems, traffic, um, airport negotiation, plane boarding, security, these systems are all uh, running below capacity. If you took the humans out and replaced them with robots, then existing control and scheduling strategies could, could deliver something that I've just described. And so what I'm interested in is how could you apply meaning, meaningful control to this system when the humans are still in it, okay, to try and improve the inefficiencies that exist in them currently. So I apologize for the extreme text, <laughs> texty nature of this slide, but I'm going to read all this outright because I really want to pin down some properties of what I mean by a lots of humans in the loop system. So the first property is that there are lots of humans in the system independent human agents who are unaware of or unmotivated towards the actions they could take for sort of system optimal performance. And lots of different systems, lots of different things have these properties. They crop up in other fields as well, um, the decision support, for example. Um, in this particular system, this property is coupled with some, with some other properties. The second property being that there is a control action deficit. What that means is that the mechanisms for applying to con control to these <coughs> systems uh, either absent or to altogether, or they're very weak. And the final property is that optimal control strategies tend to be computationally intractable, these systems. So, so, to, so, to, so to talk you through a full example, if we use traffic control as the example, the first property arises because drivers in vehicles are unaware of the movements of all the other vehicles around them and the intentions of the drivers in these other vehicles around them. That's the first property. The second property arises because even if some benevolent controller did have all this information, all they can really do is change the lights to red or green at junctions. It's a very weak form of control on the system. 
And thirdly, even this type of control, even this limited form of control, optimal switching on junctions, on a network of junctions, is computationally intractable. So, so this is an example. This is one system which sort of seems to overcome a lot of these properties. It's our kind of, it's where we'd like to get to, right? In, <laughs> I think, I mean, you know, just intuitively, I, I think, you know, if, um, if the experience of, uh, of catching a plane was more orchestral, then it might be a, it might, it might be a, smooth, a smoother experience. But uh, here, I mean, the first property is overcome because uh, the people... They, they practice a lot together, and they, they kind of know and what each other are going to do, and they know how to anticipate it. Something that's very important is the guy at the top here, the conductor. So there's actually somebody, a human, a applying real-time dynamic control to this system. Okay, and that's very important. As to the computational intractability, I, I don't know <laughs> right, for this particular system. So for this talk, I'm going to kind of split it up into two parts. In the first part, I'm going to discuss a case study specifically looking at the traffic control problem, um, and, 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 and particularly focused on the third property of lots of humans in the loop systems, the computational intractability problem, property. And then in the second half of the lecture, I'm going to talk a bit about future work I'd like to do, um, about how to kind of generalize some of this stuff out to other lots of humans in the loop systems in general, and particularly how to address uh, other properties like... Um, the control action deficit, which I think is probably the most pressing property to be addressed. So as I've already mentioned, the problem of controlling traffic signals on, an, on a network is, is computationally intractable. So traffic control is an optimal switching problem. You have a network. The nodes of the network can only serve, cannot serve every single edge coming into them at any one time. So they have to have a switching policy. Okay? And in general, for um, a network of queues with stochastic arrival of whatever it is, vehicles in this case. Um, um, these problems have been shown by a very smart computational complexity theorist called Christos Papadimitriou at UC Berkeley to be expertine complete, um, which m functionally means that they're computationally intractable. So most, uh, most traffic-like control systems use approximate optimization approaches. There are two systems that are widely deployed in the UK, at least today. First one's called MOVER. These are all terrible acronyms, which I'm not going to bother to define. Um, but th this is designed to work on isolated junctions. Unfortunately, optimal control of each switch in the network individually does not equal globally optimal control. So actually, it's a good idea to, con to consider the movements between junctions. And this is what the second approximate optimization algorithm, SCOOT, does. Okay, it's, it's, it, it, uh, it's supposed to coordinate the action between junctions to some extent. Unfortunately, uh, oh, I should just also explain a little bit how these, how these work. Um, when I say I'm going to explain how they work, I'm actually just going to explain how they perceive the world. Um, so the sensors that these systems use to perceive the traffic are sensors called inductive loops. These are essentially metal detectors which are buried in the surface of the road. I've actually got a picture of, you can kind of see where they are. If, you, if you're cycling around Cambridge, you can look out for these squares of sort of a bead of tarmac. This is where a, a square has been cut in the road and a loop has been laid. Essentially, it returns a very simple signal, which is just a binary signal indicating the presence or absence of a large metal object <laughs> above the loop. And so you get this kind of step function coming out at 4 hertz, okay, of 1s and zeros of either there's something there or there isn't something there. And that's how, uh, that's how these systems perceive the world. Um, the actual algorithms they use to make their decisions are proprietary, so I don't, I don't know exactly how they, how they work. Ha however, by working with industrial partners, um, people like TRL and Siemens, who are the people who own the licenses for these algorithms and deploy these systems in the real world, we've been able to evaluate them in simulation by essentially using an API which connects the simulation up to the actual mover or scoop control system, whichever one we wish to evaluate. Um, 
And if you want to, you can get these simulations to output a nice sort of graphical <laughs> image of what's going on on the junction. So you can watch the vehicles driving around, um, which is kind of useful, I suppose, for sanity checking. Uh, you know, you've got everything set up properly. And I found myself watching these, watching, watching these images of vehicles driving around and actually sort of thinking, oh, maybe it should have changed the light already on this arm. Or, you know, thinking... And this motivated me to build a human interface onto this simulation so that I could uh, just kind of have, have a go at controlling the lights myself and see how, see how easy or hard it is. Um, and what we discovered quite quickly is that um, if you let a human play this game so they can see the vehicles driving around and they can choose when they want to change the lights, they actually can often outperform things like mover and scoop, so they can actually control the, tra control the traffic better. We tend to use this metric called delay to measure um, how, well, how well a junction is, is being controlled. Um, so the less delay, the better. Okay, delay being, um, I should define this actually, it's, 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 um, it's essentially excess travel time. So there's a nominal average time it takes a vehicle to drive through a junction assuming that it is unimpeded by um, red lights or other vehicles. So any amount of time it takes beyond this nominal free flow travel time is delay. And so minimizing delay is often, often a goal of that. Can I ask you, do, does everybody agree what the right objective function is? You know, like the, the Papa Dimitriou result, is that independent of, you know, is that for all reasonable objective functions? <coughs> or yeah, actually, that, actually... Simon, can you repeat the question just in the video? Oh, yes, okay. So, so, so the question was, is, is does everybody agree that delay is the best objective function for signal control? Um, and the answer is no. <laughs> it's, it's not the only, it, it, and actually I'm going to present some other metrics, so actually variance over the distribution of delay is very important because that gives you an indication of how fair a junction is being. Um, uh, and so, actually, your, 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 your objective really should be a combination of, of, of those two things. Um, there are other metrics. People are very interested in, for instance, minimizing CO2 emissions. Um, uh, actually, it turns out that, that, that that's fairly correlated with delay <laughs> because it's the stopping and starting of vehicles which, uh, which, which generates a lot of CO2. Um, but... Uh, and, and particular operators are very interested in um, predictability of travel times. They don't, they, don't, they don't mind if people, you know, conceptually, they don't mind if people spend a bit longer getting to work in the morning if they accurately know how, how long it's going to take them. They don't want there to be too much variance in, in journey time. So, 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 so there, are other, there are other metrics. Okay, so coming back to, to this slide. So, so this, is, this isn't new, right? This has been done before. <laughs> Okay, it used to be the case that humans directed the traffic, and in many cu countries, many cities around the world, they still do. Uh, this image is from Pyongyang in North Korea. Um, <coughs> so we must have lots of before and after data, right? Of, of, of how performance of traffic, light cha traffic lights changed when we switched from, when cities switch to, from human to manual to automatic control. Uh, actually, it's... It, there's surprisingly little data. There have been very few before and after studies on performance when this has happened. What, what, one of the few that I know about is a study that took place in Dakar. Uh, and this was actually a negative result. In Dakar, they changed traffic lights, and then not long afterwards, they changed back. Um, now I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying that this is, this is definitely sort of a proof that, uh, that, that human control is better. I mean, it could have been the case that the traffic lights were just set up badly in Dakar, or that they were it's just the way people perceived them. They didn't like them. But it's, it's an interesting result, none the, none, nonetheless. Um, a part of the reason for the lack of information here is um, the main motivation for changing from human control to, to, to automated control is not actually performance. It, it, it's much more safety. So traffic lights are safer because they, they don't make errors. They, they just, they're, they're set up in such a way that they just cannot give uh, green to opposing streams, right? Um, and also, actually, the safety of this poor person in the middle of the junction is, is, is really important. The, the one thing the research is very clear on is that the level of pollution <coughs> exposure of these poor people is horrendous, and the health effects associated with it are very horrible. 
And so it's not a good idea. We don't want to put people back on junctions. But of course, using our computer game, we can think about applying supervised learning to capture whatever strategies it is that the human's doing that's good and then trying to encode that some way and then use that to control the junction. So, so we still have an automatic controller, but we've essentially captured in some way what humans are doing, which makes them good. Yeah. Yeah. So when you say humans are doing, you mean humans taking decisions locally at every junction without knowing what other humans are doing in other junctions? Um, I don't mean that. Um, so the, the results I'm going to show you, I'm only going to show you up to small networks of junctions, mm -hmm. of up to three junctions. Mm -hmm. And um, in that case, the human, one human was controlling all of those junctions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there is, a, there is a discussion about how do you, can, how, how do you generalize this out to a, to a, to a whole network. Um, that's an open question. I'm, I'm not going to answer that in the course of this talk today. Uh, John? Um, so in your uh, screen, it, it seems like they can see like all the traffic and different size vehicles and all this extra information that Scoot and Mula aren't getting. Good point. Okay. So the point that John just raised is that the perception data that the human receives is much richer than the, than, than the, the Scoot system where I showed you their perception data was just from loops. So if you're going to give a human this kind of data, you'd probably need to put them at the side of the road with a little peephole and they could just see a vehicle whiz by every now and then. And then they'd have to kind of infer what was happening from that. So the question is, how much of this performance improvement is down to the better perception? And how much of it is, is actually something that the human is doing better than scoot and mover on the approximate optimization front? Um, and I'm going to present some data in a minute, which should hopefully break down those two, the, 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 the difference there. And so I'll come back to your finish answering your question when I've presented that data. Um, OK, so it turns out that applying supervised learning it, it's fairly straightforward. A, a, traffic light, a traffic signal control junction is a finite state machine. That means the, the control action space is very simple. It's just, give, given the current state, what, what, what stage of the junction should I select? So, so junctions, they have a finite number of states known as stages, which give green to various combinations of arms. And it's just a case of which, which of these should the junction be in at any one time. Okay? So control of a finite state machine is pretty much equivalent to what you machine learning type people would call a classification problem. And so you can solve it using something very simple, like a two-layer neural network, sort of a vanilla, fully connected two-layer neural network of the kind you find in, in Chris Bishop's book. Um, and so to explain, to, to add a little bit further explanation about this, I'm going to now go through a little bit what the inputs to the network are, what the state space is in control language, and what the input neurons are in machine learning language. OK. So the first thing is, is in order to deal with John's point about the perception data, is what if we just let the neural network have the same data as Scoot and Mover, okay, the loop data? OK. Um, in, in that case, then, anything that's, any, any, if, if, if sort of the higher dimensional behavior decisions that the human is making with their, with their better perception data, if that can be captured in this lower fidelity data, then that would be a good thing. And I suppose that would kind of indicate that the human was doing something smart. Um, so to explicitly explain what goes in, um, so I mentioned before that the loops return this um, binary signal, 4 hertz binary signal, <coughs> presence or absence. There's a measure, a metric called occupancy. Uh, time occupancy is just defined as over, over a given amount of time, what is the fraction of ones to the fraction of zeros, okay? So what fraction of time during a given time period was the loop occupied? There's a vehicle above it. And so we have occupancy over 20 seconds for each loop. And in that simple T-junction that was shown in the video of the game playing, there are 11 loops. Okay, and additionally, we have a couple of additional inputs, which are the decisions, the stage decisions for the previous two time steps. They go in. They go in as well. Time step is twenty seconds. It's ten seconds, um, which is actually quite coarse. Um, you could go to a smaller time step, but uh, uh, as the results I'm going to show you in a minute. I mean, that, that, that's something else to think about. Um, 
So here are some results. This is for the simple T-junction that we saw being played in the game. The, the y-axis is delay, uh, average delay, averaged over five-minute intervals. So you get this kind of transient delay over a test. This is a four-hour test, and the reason there's lumps in these curves is because the, 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 the load is being varied, the number of vehicles that are being pumped into the simulation. The blue, blue line is the performance of mover. Lower is better, of course. And you can see the performance for a neural network trained in the game with the loop data. Um, and you can see that it's kind of equivalent to, to the MOVA algorithm in light traffic, but outperforms it in heavy traffic. And so overall, it does slightly better than MOVA in controlling this junction. There's another line on that graph, and that's because... Well, what if we let the algorithm have, have the better information? Okay, so we're doing this in, in, in simulation, and we can envisage maybe some system of GPS in the vehicles or cameras monitoring the road, which can, which can pick up higher fidelity information than loops. And there's kind of sort of two goals here. Is what it, it, is in, in if, we, if we craft our in, the, the input data to be how we want it, is one, we want to use all the information we can, but also we want to limit the dimensionality of the state space. Uh, in, in particular, that will become clear when I, when, 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 later on in the talk when I talk about other methods. Um, so a common, a common strategy that's used in traffic modeling is this thing called a cell transition model. Uh, uh, Deganzo came up with this, I believe. Um, where where you, have, you break the road network up into geographical regions, these cells, and to each cell you attach a metrics like number of vehicles in the cell, average speed of vehicles in the cell, distance from some point in the network, like, for example, the next stop line. Um, and then in cell transition modeling, you just keep track of the exchange of vehicles between cells. But we aren't so interested in the exchange of vehicles between cells, but we can use this as a nice way to, to describe the state of the network. And in fact, if we want to really limit the dimensionality, we can, we can kind of fuse together the metrics in cells. So this, this here I've put this thing which I've, I kind of nominally call a bit, although maybe it's not, not the right name for it, um, which is essentially a linear function which combines the number of vehicles in the cell, their average speed of the vehicles in the cell, and the distance of those vehicles from the next junction stop line. And there are these um, coefficients that are in this equation. And these are not really tuned in any way. I, I've, just, they're just, I've given the values. They're just tuned to kind of an order of magnitude. And this is, this, this is purely to get over the fact that if you're measuring speed in meters per second, that will be quite a small number compared to distance from the junction stop line in meters. So the only point of those coefficients is to kind of equalize those values so that one doesn't particularly dominate, okay? Uh, and and it, it, this bid is kind of meaningless. I'm not sure that it, it relates to anything in the physical world, but it's just, it's, just, it's just a plausible way of really limiting the dimensionality of your input space. And so if you use bids like this, cell bids, um, you can reduce the dimensionality of that simple T-junction down to only four four-dimensional space. So you've got four cells with bids, or five-dimensional space, five, five neurons on the input. Um, and that's the other line in this, in this result. So that actually, you can, you can have a, a limited space, you can limit the dimensionality of your space a lot and actually get better performance if you do that. Okay, so that's just the simple T-junction, but I mentioned before that Control on a network is much harder. Um, and from, from an, when you tackle these problems with approximate optimization, the solving times for networks, I mean, it grows, it grows very fast with network size. Okay? So even going up to a three-junction network becomes a much, much harder problem to solve by approximate optimization. So the blue line on this graph is the performance of Scoot which is the control system which is out there in the real world today. It's, very, it's actually a very widely used control system. It's in about 250 cities worldwide. Um, and the other two lines are, as with the simple T-junction for a neural network trained by a human playing the computer game, either with just the loop data or with um, this sort of other type of data that we fashioned, the cell bids network data. And actually, the relative, the relative gain in performance is much, much greater on this harder problem, indicating that the approximate optimization type approach is starting to struggle here as you go to a network, but the human is, is still maintaining 
quite a good performance. Incidentally, if you actually play this game you, uh, as, a, as a human playing the game, you feel the cognitive workload is much, much harder when you're controlling three junctions. But in the game, you have some benefits. So you can do things like pause, take your time to make your decision, um, which, ha which help you out a lot. So, so in that example, is it, was that a symmetric, uh, you had symmetric load, was it also a sort of a random load? Uh, so the way it's set up is there is, um, it, is there's a kind of average, you set up an average loading from each origin, you have origins and destination points in the network, and you set up an average loading between them, and then you, you uh, uh, apply noise to that to get a kind of stochastic spawning of vehicles into the simulation. So does that answer your question? No, because what, I mean, it's just, that's it. you've got a symmetric network, a triangle, essentially. And it, but and were the were the end to end parts essentially um, uh, you know, was the mean essentially the same for any end to end part? Um, they're not exactly the same, no, but they're very close, they're very similar. Does that does that make sense? Okay. Is that a harder or easier case than one loaded path? You know, if A to B is very popular and C to A and C to B are unpopular, yes. is that an easier or harder case? Can you repeat the question. <laughs> Actually, can you repeat the question so I can? Okay. <laughs> I think we have mics on the questioners anyway. But um, okay. So to, to, to rephrase Peter's question, um, you have three um, entries into this network, A, B, and C. Uh, no, um, you have more than that. I think you have six, if I remember rightly. Ah, yes, right. you have six okay, entries cool. into the network. Yeah. Okay. So there are six choose two pairs. Yeah. Uh, source uh, destination pairs. Yeah. Are they, and you, you're saying they're all equally loaded? No, no, so they're not equally loaded. I mean, what we're trying to do here is, is, um, it is we're trying to model the kind of situations that occur in the real world. So this is actually a real network, and we have data on what the actual flows are in that network, and we use that to construct the matrix of origin destination. Okay, it t I mean, this network, there are, I mean, in this particular network, the, the loadings, and there's not a big asymmetry in the loadings, but there are other networks we do where there are very asy big asymmetries. And actually more interesting stuff occurs in those networks where there's big asymmetries. Mm -hmm. um, particularly when you have an arm of the junction which is, which is very infrequently serviced. Because then when you try and optimise this, this, this can tend to lead, if you're just optimising delay, this can tend to lead to uh, um, people waiting a very long time <laughs> at these infrequently serviced arms. Whereas if you consider equitability and other things, then that happens less so much. Is, is, that, is that helping? John? On your, on your plots, where do the human, where's the human line? Oh, right. OK. Um, I, I do have some, in fact, I do have a graph of, uh, of where, with the human performance on there, but it, it's much simpler. So I should explain that I d that's a four-hour simulation, and I don't ask human subjects who play this game to play for four hours. Um, to construct the training data, we ask the humans to play for a half-hour half test. And actually, they, the, the human players can choose how fast they run the simulation. And most people choose to run it at about four times real speed. Okay, so it takes sort of around 10 minutes to play a game. Um, and they'll play that at a fixed level of loading. And then they'll come have a break, and they'll come back and play at another fixed level of loading. And that's how the training data is generated. Um, the test data that I'm showing there you've got um, a much longer test with variable loading, but that's just using the trained network. So humans, I haven't got data of humans playing that. Um, because, I mean, part of the reason is that actually humans, when I say they're good at this task, they're good at it for a limited amount of time. They, get, they, they fatigue quite quickly as well. So on just a simple half hour um, test with the same loading, this, you've got the performance of, this, this is on the simple T-junction mover, this is averaged over the whole test, versus the human, versus the neural network trained by the human with, with the cell structure. Um, what about the best human? The best human? Presumably you. <laughs> I'm not the best human, actually, which is kind of frustrating. <laughs> and I'm going to present some variation in human data in a, in a, in a, in a, in a minute. Um, so how am I doing for time, actually? I'm going to... OK, all right, so I need to start sort of speeding through a bit. Um, in fact, let's do that now then. Uh, so I mentioned before variance, variance over the, 
over the over the, the delay is, is 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 an important metric. And here I plot variance on that triangular network for scoot versus neural network trained by a human with the loops. Um, you can probably visually see from those distributions that the variance is a bit narrow in the neural network. So it outperforms scoot in the delay, as we've already seen, but also in this other metric of variance over delay, which is a can be considered as a proxy for equitability of the junction. Okay, so a couple of questions, sort of preempting a couple of questions, one that's actually just come up already, which is um, how, how good are humans generally at this problem? Is, is the person you've got training this neural network, uh, they, like a, do they have some special abilities, or is this something that any, anyone can do? So we got we, we sort of answered this question to some extent when we, we took the game to a public science outreach event at the Royal Society in London, which is called the Summer Science Exhibition. It's a week-long event. We had a stand there, and some people played our game. Andrew, did you play the game? I can't remember. I should, I should have logged your score, actually, shouldn't I? <laughs> well, we did log the scores. We logged the scores from 830 games. Now, so the human that trained the neural network in the data I've already I've already presented, let's call them subject X, right? <laughs> These are the scores, the relative scores, the relative delay on the junction um, relative to their score. So zero would be the score of subject X, and negative numbers are people who beat this subject, and positive numbers are people who didn't do as well. Um, and you can see that, that, that the subject we use to train, to train the game, to train the neural network in this game, is, is a good but not exceptional player of the game. Several, of the, several people got better scores when, when playing this at the Royal Society. You can also break, um, break the data down a little bit by, uh, <laughs> by, by type of player. <laughs> so for most, of the, for most of this week, during the weekday daytimes, um, it's mainly school kids bust in who, 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 who visit, but there are two evenings which are black tie events reserved for fellows of the Royal Society, and we can look at the relative distributions. And, well, you know, of course the kids beat the fellows, right? <laughs> but, but, I mean, so maybe that's just a bit of levity. But there's a, there's maybe, if you want to take a point from that, I suppose this does indicate that, that no particular special technical knowledge is required to perform well at these games, right? It seems to be a sort of intuitive thing rather than a, rather than a special knowledge required to do this. Um, the other... The other question that might arise is, well, maybe this is just an artifact of your simulation. What happens if you try this out in the real world? Does, does it still work? So we had a go at trying it out in the real world, and we conducted a, an embodied simulation experiment at a junction, and um, this was actually filmed by the BBC, so I'm going to just play you a small clip now. We've taken over a test track. We have a junction with four lights and 30 cars driving around continuously. Let's see who can get the most cars through the lights, man or machine. First up, the UTC. It has to decide if road A or road B gets the green light. Simon and I are watching from above the junction. We've got a nice big queue on this, this leg. Yeah, we can see some vehicles building up and the junction's just given them the green light, so that was definitely a good move that the computer made there. But now they're building up here. So really, we'd want the computer to be changing the light to green for them pretty soon. There. I would have done it already. Because now this is uh, green. Here. Yeah, exactly. But there was nobody there. The computer uses an average time it will take for vehicles to get through the lights. When cars get through faster, it means another lane needlessly sits at red. OK, Helen, um, if you could stop the test, that would be great. Thank you. After 15 minutes, 323 cars have got through the lights under UTC control. Right. So now, now you get to, get to have a go. <laughs> so, how many cars can I get through? Come on, you lot. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Go, 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 go. You've got to be constantly thinking, sort of, right, where's the traffic? Where's it going to be? It's going to be cleared in about... Yep, right, I'll go now. They'll whip through, OK. Yeah, that was perfectly timed, I've got them through. I'm getting the hang of this. I can anticipate how long each lane needs a green light. Two, one, now. Thank you. When you were controlling the junction, 386 cars made it through the junction. Yep. When the computer was controlling it before, 323 cars made it through. In the yes! So yeah. that's <laughs> <laughs> OK, so, you know... Uh, not the world's most scientific test, uh, just, just one result, right? But, uh, 
But, but uh, the, you know, this uh, TV presenter here, Mart Marty Jobson, who, again, is someone with obviously without special knowledge or practice at doing this, this problem, actually was, was, turned out to be quite good, quite good at controlling the junction. Um, <clears throat> obviously, while this test was going on, we, we had GPS in all the vehicles and collecting lots of data so we could analyze the, the delay. And, and, and the improvement was quite big. It was about 30% improvement that he got on this test. Although I should point out that the automatic control system was not, was, was at this test track was not actually up there with the most advanced systems that are operating in the world today. So some, we need to deconvolute those results a bit, but we can certainly say that, you know, Marty Jobson did okay at controlling that junction. Um, okay, so, so, so look, just, um, so we can, I, I think m maybe I've managed to convince you that humans can be, can do quite well at this junction and they can perform favorably in comparison to the type of uh, approximate optimization based um, control systems that are out there like Mover and Scoot. But what about approximate optimization in general, right? M maybe there's just, I've already said that Scoot and Mover are proprietary, so we can't get in and dig around and, and find out what's happening inside. So it's nice to test, it's to, to give us some confidence, it's nice to test against some of the sort of approximate optimization approaches that are suggested in the transport research literature. Um, Something that's very popular at the moment in signal control papers in the literature is temporal difference learning, um, particularly this Q-learning algorithm that I've put up here. I need my, yeah. This is kind of a, this is, this is a, a sort of beautifully simple algorithm. It's very, it has a lot in common with things like um, dynamic programming. Um, essentially, you have this, these discrete values, Y here, which are applied to com state action combinations. So combinations of states and decisions of which states to select. And you run this in simulation, and each and your value gets updated at each step according to a simple low-pass filter, where on this side you have this term R, which is a reward feedback, which, in, in, which is, is the delay going up or going down, is the delay experienced by vehicles increasing or decreasing. And then you have this kind of bootstrapping term, which says, if you go, if you if you happen to move to a, a state which ha is, has high value, that's considered a good thing. Um, now it turns out that this simple approach, this temporal difference learning approach, which is quite popular in the transport literature, it can be applied to a neural network. Um, and this has actually been done before. Um, quite um, so, the first person to do this, I think, was probably Gerald Tesoro, when he applied temporal difference learning of this type to his backgammon, computer backgammon program. And so you can do the same thing by backpropagation in a neural network just to update the weights. And again, we have this reward term, the bootstrapping term. And there's an additional term here, which is often used. This is a, what this does is it conveys reward back to previous decisions. So what that says is the decision I've, that just suddenly led to me getting a lot of reward, maybe that's not the only decision that deserves credit. So I'll give some credit to the <coughs> preceding few decisions as well. Um, and so this is quite a nice, uh, the fact that you can apply this to a neural, neural network means we can compare it to supervised learning to our human on a very level playing field because we can use exactly the same network that we use with a human. We just instead of, we just take the human out of the loop and plug this temporal difference learning in instead, okay, and see how this approximate optimization approach trained on, tra trained on simulation compares to the human. So again, on our um, triangular network, you can see that temporal difference learning actually does very well um, compared to our lower baseline scoot, but compared to our upper baseline, which is the performance of the human, it's, it's, it's actually still not as good. Okay, so it also takes a lot longer to train, so the temporal difference learning there was, this is, um, in a simulation time, there's actually a couple of months used to train, to train to that level of performance. Um, okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about stability and temporal difference, but I'm going to skip over that a bit because I, I think I'm running out of time. Um, so why are humans good at controlling traffic lights? Um, so there's lots of examples in the literature, in, in scientific literature, of problems, of computationally difficult problems which, hum which life exhibits good performance at. So there's this famous example of slime mold growing the Tokyo, <laughs> the Tokyo railway network, so network construction. Okay, mold is quite good at that apparently. Um, Nice, nice paper in Nature from the late 1970s, John Krebs investigating 
how great tits uh, forage, and it turns out that they, they, use, they use quite close to optimal um, exploration versus exploitation strategies when they forage. Famous result from computer science in the late 60s, uh, very famous computer scientist Dr. Donald Mickey um, tested the performance of humans against his graph search algorithms for solving traveling salesman problems, and one of his subjects out outperformed his graph search algorithm. Um, so, I, th I think it's clear that, you know, computationally hard problems, um, l you know, have been solved quite effectively by life. Um, usually, I guess, this is because there's some kind of evolutionary imperative. Um, in the case of problems like traveling salesmen and traffic lights, I don't know what you can say about those. I mean, may maybe there's some kind of analogy to something that we're evolutionarily tuned for. So, for example, the traveling salesman problem might be a little bit like the foraging problem, which uh, we know tits can solve optimally. Um, maybe there's other factors as well in, in the traffic lights. Maybe, maybe something to do with it is that the humans can empathize with the human agents in the system um, and have good heuristics for coming up with results that way. Interestingly, I think it would be very good to be able to understand why, what problems humans are good at and what problems they aren't and why, because it would, it would be a very good guide for whether you consider supervised learning like this to, to tackle certain types of problems in the future. So now I want to move on to this idea of future work and how to kind of expand what I've been talking about out to lots of humans in the loop problems in general, and in particular, how to address the control action deficit. So as I mentioned before, um, there's, there's a limit in the control you can place on these systems. In traffic systems, you can only change traffic lights, which is a limited form of control. In things like, um, actually, I'll just skip back a slide. In things like crowd control, um, building evacuation, there's, there's almost no um, real-time dynamic control on these systems. You can do sort of architectural uh, control of, like, you know, of routing people, and you can m maybe apply some limited scheduling. But dynamic control is more or less completely absent in these systems. It's quite timely to think about how you might apply dynamic control um, because the technology is sort of there already, right? So you've got in-vehicle systems. Um, a lot of work now is being going in. A lot of European money is being put into investigating um, setting up Wi-Fi networks on the roads so that people can have Wi-Fi in their cars. Okay, so you've got a, you've got a, you've got a um, possibility for communication, communicating um, instructions or information to drivers. You've also got the possibility of applying partial or full automation. And in the pedestrian scenario, when you're not in a vehicle, you, you've got smartphones. And smartphones are becoming extremely prevalent. I think the penetration rate in the UK is over 50% now. That's actually grown incredibly fast. The adoption rate of smartphones has been faster than computers and the internet and even, even credit and debit cards, which are the most ubiquitous, the deployed personal computing device, I think. Um, and of course, you, know, you can consider other things as well, like augmented reality goggles. There's plenty of ways you could consider applying, getting control actions into these systems. The question is, is how do you actually design the control? Because I think, and I think this needs some thought, right? Because I think if you just decided to design apps on phones, for, for example, for putting control to these systems using the approach of just the plausible thinking of the designer, I think that could be pretty disastrous. I think what you need is some kind of lots of human in the loop control theory to be able to develop effective control. So how to go about developing this? Well, I think that the computer game and computer games and also games in embodied simulation like the, um, the TV clip I showed you are a really good way of investigating the dynamic to these systems. So you could envisage multiplayer computer games where you have humans can join in the game as, as human agents in the system, in a lots of humans in the loop system, and you can simulate control action technologies, like the, the kind of things you might get through a smartphone or an in-vehicle system, or maybe message screens or something else. And you can investigate within these games or embodied simulations, how does applying control to lots of humans in the loop system affect their dynamics? What's the dynamic between applying control and feedback, what that actually does, how, how that actually affects the system? That's currently unknown. 
And I think that games, both computer games and embodied simulation, would be a great way of investigating how that happens. And, and a particular way of doing this would be, instead of trying to faithfully simulate a lots of humans in a loop system like we have with the traffic junction, I think a better starting point is to try and create abstract games which just capture certain features of lots of human in the loop systems. So to give you an example, I want to show you an, uh, show, show you an example of how this is a, of an abstract game which is currently done in this area. So this is, um, this is some work by a colleague of mine, Professor Eddie Wilson at the University of Bristol. Um, and what he's doing here is investigating how vehicle, very simple abstract game, okay, so this is not something that occurs in the real world, vehicles driving around in a circle, okay. And what you get here is when the vehicles are close together, you get an effect happens where the vehicles get bunched up and someone has to brake, and this creates a wave which actually propagates backwards <coughs> around the circle. And you should be able to see now that as the vehicles drive around, there's a stopping, there's a wave of vehicles where they stop, and that this actually travels backwards around the circle. So this is a nice ab abstract game which captures this dynamics. And this dynamics exists in the real world. This is data from the M25 speed data taken from inductive loops in the M25. There are pairs of inductive loops every 500 meters on the M25. This is a space-time plot. Um, space on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. The color is speed of vehicles. Um, and these red lines are these stopping, vehicles coming to a stop in a stop-go wave. And you can notice the gradient of these lines. These waves are traveling backwards at the M25. And notice how the gradient is incredibly consistent. Is these waves always seem to move backwards at about 12 kilometers an hour. Um, so, so there's some dynamics you can capture in a simple embodied, embodied simulation. And it's there in the real world as well. And this is not a, just a vehicle thing, right? This is actually general dynamics, which is general to lots of human in the loop problems. You can also do it with people. Uh, this is a, a researcher in France, a guy called Julian Petra in Rio, tried uh, and others as well, but he had a particularly nice video of it. I've done this with people. He used cameras to capture the people, and he, you can see this stop-go wave emerges as well, and you can see the space-time plot has these backwards-moving waves as well. So then let's think about actually... So you can use these things to, to, to capture the dynamics of these systems. How to actually apply control? Well, obviously, if you can capture simple dynamics, relations like the stop-go wave, but in, in systems which are undergoing dynamic control, and you can investigate the feedback there, then maybe you can model that, you can capture models, and maybe that will help you develop control. But maybe that's not enough. Maybe we should also consider what we had with the, with the traffic signal control problem, the fact that we know it's a computationally hard problem and that humans are actually very good at it. So maybe it's worth considering introducing to our games a different class of player a controller player, humans, which can apply, can apply controls to the system. And if it turns out that humans are, can apply effective control, then we can look at capturing that you know, via supervised learning in exactly the same way we did with the traffic lights. And I think that might be a good sort of program of how to think about starting to develop um, lots of humans in the loop control in general for these kind of systems. Um, yeah, OK. So to end. That, that, that might be sound, sound slightly um, abstracted, so I want to just give you kind of a motivating example. I actually think the examples of this that you can logically follow through are maybe not the, um, maybe not the most interesting ones, but here's one that you can sort of logically follow through end to end and maybe, I hope it maybe makes sense. So I want you to imagine there's a building, a 20-story building like a hotel uh, with three stairwells, A, B, and C, and that there's a fire somewhere around the middle, somewhere around the 10th story, that has got into two of the stairwells, A and B. So you could imagine that there was some kind of trivial good strategy for evacuating this building, which might be something like, let's tell everybody below story eight to evacuate via stairwells A and B, because it's safe for them to go in there, and none of them to evacuate via stairwell C, because that stairwell needs to take all the traffic from above. Okay? Um, so the question then becomes, well, how do we actually get the people in the building to follow this evacuation strategy? And so there's a trivial but brute force solution, which is let's have an expert with expert knowledge of the layout of the hotel and knowledge of the evacuation strategy. Let's have one expert for every person in the hotel, and let's get them to call them up and, fit and actually guide them out of the building, talking to them on their phone. 
Um, now, I think it should be. It sh I think it should be clear that 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 would probably work and may even save lives. It's just uh, and in practice, very impractical. So what you might like to have is, if that's very impractical, you might like to have something that can essentially do this job, but that's uh, essentially a software agent, an app on a smartphone or in some kind of digital device that's in the hotel and has been given to the guests. Okay? And then the question arises, well, how would we train, how would we design the control for this device? And I think by gaming this scenario and perhaps using expert human controllers in the gaming of the scenario, that might be an effective way to develop automatic lots of humans in the loop control for a system like this, which may have some value. And th that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have a, a few minutes for questions. Tori? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you think at all about how one could create a learning algorithm for a general topology that would, or in some sense being independent of the topology, that would create features from a given graph and then be able to control? Um, so, I mean, I have thought about that. I mean, I haven't done it. <laughs> but, I, I mean, I think, so for example, I've thought about maybe trying to look at the junctions that are out there in the real world and in some way classify them, so types of junctions, and then maybe ha apply, gen apply some learning to those particular different classes and then try applying those to, to those with variation. I think that would be a really interesting project. Uh, I think that's a project that, that should happen. <laughs> I just haven't got around to doing it yet. <laughs> um, Yes, and, and, and I guess that's what I was trying to get to a little bit when I was talking about sort of trying to generalize and abstract these games, is trying to capture the kind of underlying features rather than looking at a particular lo lots of humans in the loop system, try and come up with some sort of abstracted games which represent sort of the f fundamental aspects of it. Um, I, I think that is obviously the, the right way to do it. Incidentally, if you did have to train every single junction individually, that wouldn't actually be, I mean, that might not be very aesthetically pleasing, <laughs> But actually, from a functional point of view, that wouldn't be a problem. The number of man hours that currently go into setting up a, a, a new traffic junction when it gets installed are, are huge and many, many times greater than the amount of time required to play the game for a couple of hours. So actually, it wouldn't, it, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a killer if, if, if that was the only way of solving the problem. It seems that um, some of the major causes of traffic problems on motorways are uh, humans driving into the side wall or each other, um, i.e. crashing and blocking the motorway. Um, it does feel to the average driver that the speed when you exit the uh, crash zone is much higher, so the throughput out of the crash zone feels higher than the throughput in. Mm -hmm. uh, humans merging, you know, when they didn't expect to, are very slow. Do you think there's any possibility to rapidly fix that. Oh yeah, well, um, uh, automated driving. Yeah. Sure. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no, it doesn't cure, it doesn't, it doesn't, fix, every, it doesn't fix everything, actually. It's, uh, automated driving fixes a lot. I mean, it allows you to apply more control. Um, it doesn't completely take the hu inf human influence out. Humans, I mean, in most of the, in most of the, actually, I'm, 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 on a, I'm on a tangent now, but I'll just quickly wrap that up and then I'll come back and answer your question. Um, but most of the visions that I've heard of sort of automated driving involve humans are still cho able to choose when they make their journey and they're able to, for example, decide they want to divert and go to the shops or something like this. You know, th th they actually have sort of real-time input. So there's a, st there's a stochasticity from humans in these systems that still exists, right? Even if you had um, full control and obviously partial control more so. Um, so people can, people can this, this stop-go wave, right, this, uh, this dynamics, I mean, this can, be, this can be generated in models as well. And the way to get rid of it in the model is you just remove the human reaction time term and, it, and the stop-go wave disappears. So if you, can, if you can get rid of the human reaction time problem, uh, either by partial control or full control, then that would be a huge help. Also, what also helps a lot is actually just c people driving in to the region, just slowing them down, and that is why there are variable speed limits on the M25. And that is why you see a variable speed limit, and it's saying, why, why is it telling me to go 40 miles an hour, because it feels like there's no cars around me. That's what it's trying to do, it's trying to gate you, to stop people slowing in and reduce those stop and go waves. And that's another way of ameliorating that problem, which does actually work quite effectively. Uh, one last question, Kenji. I'm just wondering, um, how do you 
how this applies to air traffic control because there's big, um, you know, single European skies project to do a single air traffic control system and to reduce congestion in the air. Um, and also, you know, takeoffs and landings and those types of things. I mean, there are airways, so you essentially have motorways in the sky. But then in the US, with free flight as well, where pilots are just allowed to free roam, <laughs> which I guess is an infinitely difficult problem. But um, I just wonder how, how this type of approach applies to that, where it's a much more, you've got the human controllers. So, yes. You know, um, so there's an advantage over traffic control and whether these sorts yes. of things can apply. Well, essentially, I mean, air traffic control is, is, is almost a little bit like the orchestra example that I showed in the beginning, in which you have dynamic control, real-time control being applied by humans in the loop, right, which is your air traffic controllers. And, and so this is much more of a kind of traditional problem that people have looked at applying learning to, a, prob a problem like things like the Watson project and things like that, something which we know humans can do well but computers can't do right now. And then we say, okay, so let's make a computer try and do it. Um, the traffic control world one is slightly different because this is a problem that's routinely solved by computers and it's not done by humans much at all. But actually, if you come back and look at some of these other problems, things, and again, the building evacuation problem, that's an example which is, it plausibly could be solved by humans but isn't because it's just totally impractical. I think it's quite interesting to look for these problems which are not the, the less obvious problems, right? The problems which aren't currently being solved by humans but maybe actually if you tried applying it in using games and things to apply human control, maybe that they would actually come up with effect, effective solutions in, in, in those scenarios. Um, I guess the question, do you augment the human controllers with stuff you're learning here in the automated control systems to make the humans more efficient at control? Well, yes. I mean, I mean, the benefit of, I mean, so the thing that, that, that works with the traffic, particularly in the traffic control example, is that the human exhibits high performance but as I mentioned, for a limited time. And actually, there's some evidence in some of, of mistakes that humans make getting filtered out. Because of course, when you do supervised learning, you smooth, right? You smooth a lot to avoid overfitting. And what this means is that is if a human, when they're playing the game, what they tend to do is, is generally play very well, but make the occasional mistake. Like a very common mistake is just pressing the wrong button. And those mistakes actually get filtered out because <laughs> they don't get captured. Um, uh, and, and I don't know, I mean, I don't know enough about the air traffic control problem to say that, yes, this would definitely, you could definitely do this. But I mean, I guess that would, that would be, that would, if you could, that would be the benefit, that the fact that you, you would, if you could capture what the humans are doing sufficiently well, then you, you, you ameliorate, you can, well, you, don't, you completely get rid of the fatigue issue and the error issue. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll, we'll wrap up there. Simon's around for at least another half an hour or so, so if you have any more questions, you're welcome to um, ask him informally afterwards. And with that, let's thank Simon for a fascinating talk.